Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. At the core of what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I can take all the financial data and the trend data in the financials and rack and stack every company and set them up. I can stack them one on top of the other. This one is better than this one. This one's better than this one. This one's better than this one. The way I actually do it is by assigning a rating to them that is not an agency rating, just my own rating, right? And then comparing that to where the market actually trades those bonds, right? I can look at a bond and say, well, this is trading, and there's some complexities in this, right? Because bonds have different maturities, they have different coupons, so you need to fix all that quantitatively. But you can look at a bond and say, it's trading here in the market, and that implies the market thinks it's rated like this. But my model actually says it's much better than that, or much worse than that. And I only look at this, I'm I'm long only, so I only look at the stuff that's much better. And then I'm applying some other filters to try to catch some of the mistakes that happen, like uh, deteriorating financials, high, you know, equity getting pummeled for some reason, and I don't know what's going on to try to filter out some of the risks. And that's, and that's basically what I'm doing, but I'm quantitatively ranking every single bond in the universe, um, and then looking at where it trends. Hello, we're digging into the crazy world of credit and business and bonds on this week's episode. Okay, okay, I lied. It's not all that crazy. It is bonds after all, but applying a quant approach to which high yield non-investment grade bonds to put in a portfolio is crazy interesting, uh, at least to me. And we've got one of the pioneers in that space to talk through it with us. Today's guest is Greg Obenchain, whose career in the credit world has spanned an almost internship at Enron to running a billion dollar book at Apollo Group. Uh, now as partner and head of the credit fund at Verdad Cap. So welcome, Greg. We were just talking offline how you grew up in Chicago briefly. Spent two years in Chicago in high school and then went back there for business school. Went to Kellogg. All right. And so where, where were you coming from and then where did you go to before your brief Chicago stint? I lived in, I grew up in London for a while, for five years. Wow. Uh, before I came back to Chicago for two and then uh, went to Dartmouth for undergrad. And then, then and it moved down to D.C., went to Boston and ended back at Northwestern. Um, before coming back out to the East Coast. Nice. So you, you do have a little Midwest twang, it sounds like, instead of a London, uh, a London <laughs> accent. I'm the most, mid- most Midwestern guy you'll ever meet who grew up in London. <laughs> nice. And wait, where'd you grow up in Lincoln Park? Yeah, Lincoln Park. Near the zoo. Uh, and we were just talking, went to high school at Latin briefly, where a couple of my siblings and some friends went. So shout out to the Romans. Uh, you play any sports there? Ran cross country, swam, and then uh, played a very embarrassing season of JV basketball. <laughs> there you go. That's like me. I was on the JV golf team as a uh, senior in high school down in Florida. Uh, everyone was too good for that. Yep, uh, same story. Exactly. It was the era of the Bulls. Yeah. It's a great, great time to be in Chicago. Yep. Um, and so where are you now? That's the, uh, we were, where are you now? In Connecticut? Yeah, I'm, I'm up in Connecticut. I'm in the northwest corner of Connecticut. Um, uh, and uh, Verdad is actually located out of Boston. So I go there every once in a while. And my wife works part time out of New York. So we are uh, remote to both places. Perfect. And that was in existence pre COVID or that's been a COVID thing? Uh, that was, it started pre COVID and then COVID made it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so we were in New York and then, and then and decided to stay up in Connecticut. So Northwestern Connecticut. So what, yeah. what are you closest to? Uh, town of Litchfield. Okay. Um, but like what big city? Hartford? Uh, we'd be west of Hartford. Yeah. West there's, of another, Hartford. there's another city called Torrington in between. And then we're west of that. There's really, there's really nothing that close. 
<laughs> um, that sounds good. You know, you know, Ben Hunt, you on the farm, farm life with him? I, I'm north of Ben Hunt. I know where he is. I don't know him personally, but he's, uh, he's down in Westport. You guys should trade some farming notes. Um, yeah. So little Marcy, we're back to Northwestern Dartmouth undergrad. I tried to get in there and they uh, said, no, I was either not smart enough or not good enough at football or both. But uh, how, how was that? I, I was wanted to go to Dartmouth. I visited lovely town. It's uh, I tell everybody it's the best school in the world. I'm not yeah. unabashed, unabashed about it. Uh, great time. You know, it's hard to be uh, stressed out when you can look up and see the mountains and the Appalachian trail goes through, through your main street. So I loved it. I rode up there um, crew and um, it was, I was outdoors every afternoon on the river. Uh, pretty hard, to, pretty hard to beat. Yeah. I hear you. I never knew that Appalachian trail goes is part of it's on main street. Yep. goes right down main street can't be too much longer on the trail once you get to there right yeah how so, much further north does it go it goes way it, it goes it goes a ways up into maine up to up to katahdin i've never done it but it ends up in katahdin up, up in maine all right bucket list hike hike parts i hike parts of it but uh like two mile parts of it not not anything significant So how did Verdad come around? Give us the story. So he left college. Sure. Um, yeah, I actually went to, um, uh, in, I was a consultant after college. So I wasn't in finance, never never applied to be a banker, uh, never had any interest in doing investment banking. Uh, so the question of how I got into this and then um, went back to business school um, and was actually interested in, in energy. And I'm, uh, I was the only guy applying to Enron as it blew up because they uh. had a subsidiary um called uh well it was zond and then it became enron wind um and uh three days before i uh, got my offer letter for my internship it became ge wind energy so uh my my business school internship was under the wind turbines 100 miles north of la um and uh because i wanted to do renew back maybe before before everybody else i wanted to do renewable energy this is very early days um and then ended up going into ge's leadership program out of um out of business school uh, and as part of that process, got into the GE's uh, Energy Financial Services Group, and that's sort of how I launched my finance career. I'd, I'd actually studied for and passed all three levels of the CFA uh, during that time, even though I wasn't technically in finance. So I had to wait two years to get the designation uh, <laughs> because I didn't have the work experience required, required but I had passed all the tests um, and then ended up going to a firm down in New York called um, Stone Tower Capital, which uh, got acquired by Apollo, and at Apollo, I ran high yield, uh, performing high yield for Apollo for four years, um, and uh, that was and how, that was the background. Of, yeah, of how big was that. Apollo at the time, and how big have they grown to? Oh, it was it was it was very large at the time, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, I yeah. was well managing well over a billion of bonds um, yeah. at, at Apollo, and um, and uh, I, I I had. You know, I did that for 10 years, a combination of Stone Tower and Apollo. Um, my, my background is really as a fundamental credit analyst. Um, and I should tell the listeners that I'm now almost fully quantitative. Um, so that, that shift from almost fully um, fundamental, looking at reading indentures, looking at bonds, and then to a almost purely quantitative approach, um, at least on the screening, um, uh, the, the inkling of the idea came when I was working at Stone Tower and Apollo, but I left Apollo to go chase the dream of building a fully quantitative approach to investing in fixed income because I thought it was uh, very difficult to do. You need to build your own databases. Um, you know, while everybody in the equity world is used to being able to pull down a bunch of data on a company and see both the stock price and the financials together, that's, that's virtually impossible to do for bonds. Um, or any individual company, you can pull down the, the, um, the credit metrics and the, and the bond price, but to do it over time for every company and do it systematically, you have to build your own database. And so I really set out on a quixotic quest to see, quest to see if I could do that. Um, I thought I could, and I could. It took a while. It was a little, of course, harder and longer than I thought. And in I was out pitching the idea to many different firms, um, trying to figure out what iteration of the product I wanted to create when I met Dan at Verdad Advisors. Um, and he uh, had nothing to do with credit, but had a very similar view of the world and a very similar approach. Um, 
meeting with quant and then doing the fundamental work at the at the end so a sort of a quantum mental approach um and i called him and said let's start a let's start a bond fund together um and go into the for that umbrella uh and do that and so that's what i've been doing for the last over two years now um uh and so he he sought you out or you sought him out or a little bit of both we did not seek each other out we met as as people said we should talk to each other i had I don't think either of us thought anything would come of it. It was purely a networking call and because yeah. we thought the same way. Uh, well, you should it, always take those calls, right? And, Even though yeah. as painful as they seem to be sometimes. Yeah, no, it was, it, and, it, and it ended up, and, and, you know, and it was a few months later when I finally called him back and sort of said, hang on a second. Sounds like we're doing sort of the same thing. Let's do something together. But uh, first it was just, I thought what he was doing was really interesting and he thought what I was doing was very interesting. So a few things to unpack there and we can get more into it, but it's always strikes me that's amazing that you had to build your own database, right? There's many, will you tell me, are there many multiples of bond volume over stock volume, especially in these smaller size companies? Um, but the data is just not there, right? You'd think with all the bond trading that there is, there would be, you know, copious amounts of data. Yeah, there's lots of data. It's just, um, and uh, well, I mean, just to, to give everybody sort of a sense of, of how this world works, because it's, it's really different, right? Uh, let's just take Netflix, because Netflix has bonds. Right, you know, everybody knows the equity, but they have bonds as well. Um, they've raised a lot of debt to fund the content, and they started in high yield, right? So they were a high yield issuer, um, and they were rated in the middle of high yield. Um, so they traded, you know, pretty, uh, you know, it was, the bonds were it was fairly relatively expensive debt, not that expensive, right? They'd have several, call it five hundred to a billion dollar issues that are outstanding. Uh, they're all bought by institutional investors. Um, for the most part, um, and uh, those trade in million dollar lots, right? Um, so there's plenty, and they might not trade every day. So if you look at a, a price chart of of bonds based on trades, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of flat lines in there with yeah. jiggles up and down, right? It, <laughs> it, it looks a lot different than, than a stock price chart because uh, in equities you have a centralized repository of bid and asks from all the brokers, right? So there's a, there's the bed, bid, best bid, best offer. Okay. So stock prices, even if not a lot of tra tra trading, you can see the, the quoted price going up and down by the second. Uh, bonds, that doesn't exist. There is no best bid, best offer database. It, it, and so the only thing you have are trades, right? So you look at historical price data based on trades, or you based on it based on uh, an aggregation of broker quotes. And literally that means you call Morgan Stanley and say, where are you on this bond? Or they actually send out emails, still emails on Bloomberg, right? <laughs> it's getting a little better. Um, it's getting a lot better actually, but that's still how this, this market trades. You're trying, you're buying million. I mean, if you want to think about how this market works, you're buying million dollar lots on the phone. Like that is the old way of doing it. And slowly we're getting towards a, an electronic market, but we still don't have that centralized. Um, bid, Which, best, in, bid. Sorry, yeah. I got you off. Just what, what are the reasons for that? Is, that, is it a moneymaker for Wall Street? So they're not incented to kind of centralize it? You know, I, oh, I, no I, one I has the I, money to dis, uh, disrupt it? Yeah, the cynic, you know, there's been a lot of people who've tried to disrupt it. Um, and I, I think a, a, huge, a huge obstacle um, is that, there is nobody's mandated that centralized um, pricing uh, service. But, you know, it's just, and I think it does benefit a lot of people to keep it the way it is, specifically people who trade a lot of bonds. <laughs> um, yeah. And also it's a very, it, it actually works, honestly works fine for the big players, right? And, and so, or the high frequency can't, where it's too large lot right. sizes for them and to so come it, in. It actually, it, um, it works well for some people. So, um, but as a result, um, you haven't had the investment in, or the, or the, it, there hasn't been the demand for that sort of quantitative data set um, that I, yet. And it's it's coming. It's it's here. Now, now I'm saying this, and that's probably a, th a statement that's three years old, right? They, there yeah. now is a lot of demand for quantitative every, quant and everything, um, but it's been very hard to do in high yield, and the dispersion of returns are lower in fixed income, right? So you're talking about adding two to 3% alpha, right? Not 10 to 12 in your back tests. So it doesn't get people as excited, right? And I think especially equity quants who try to come into the fixed income world, it's, it's hard. 
<laughs> you can't do as much and the returns are lower. So it's kept people out, um, which is good for me. Um, yeah. But it's, 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 a, it's, a tough, it's a tough space to, to penetrate. And so the folks at Verdad were doing similar stuff, but just on the equity side. And you said, hey, let's, let's put this together and see what we can do. Yeah, Verdad is, it's, it's DNA is small cap value. Um, and they've done a great job uh, with quantitative. Um, yes, quantitative. Yeah, um, the quantitative. But we're all, we're 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 really a quantum mental firm. So we 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 run all the we we spend a lot of time building our models, but then we actually look at what we're buying. So it's not fully. And you can't. And in both places where we trade, you can't just go in and buy everything on the on the wire, right? Small cap equity. You do need to. Tr- actually pay attention to what you're buying and how you're buying it and not moving markets. And the same thing is true in fixed income in high yield. And so specifically, I trade high yield, sub-investment grade bonds, but at the very top end. So guys like Charter Communications, Netflix, think people, people you've heard of very mm-hmm. often. Um, Crocs has, yeah. has high yield bonds. I just got in trouble on Twitter the other day. I was like, look at this stock, that, uh, this thing that hasn't been cool since 2012. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? This is the coolest. It's it's back in spades. I'm like, all right. I, I they've done. That. They've done it. They've done a great job. Um, they've moved. They've moved beyond the clog, apparently. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, everyone's like, it's the physical equivalent of NFTs. Like you can put a skin on your shoe and make it. Cool. I'm like, all right. I still don't get it, but no. <laughs> if they're making money, I'm happy. Yeah. So to me, how do you how do you square that of like the model shoots out Netflix. Netflix vol is crazy or like what what would it take for you to be like we're passing on the fundamental side versus what the model spits out yeah so um uh sometimes it's just thing it's usually something the model can't see right um you, you know there's there's many different models some 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 are mental models some are some are quantitative models and the quantitative models can see what it can see it can see what the historic numbers are uh, it can see uh, how those stack up relative to everybody else, and it can do that better than a human every single time, right? So it can rack and stack companies and do relative value better than I ever could. And when you think about an analyst sitting at a chair at one of these big banks looking at relative value on credit, they've got five comps that they're looking at that are sort of in the same industry. And my models are doing this over a thousand comps. And, and doing, so they're, they're just going to be better at relative value based on numbers that it can observe. But if the company just announced an acquisition or the company just said, guess what? We're going to lever up to buy back our stock and we're going to be good at seven times leverage. My model can't see that, right? So um, it can see the stock price is going up because they're about to do a huge dividend. That's yeah. good, usually, right? <laughs> and it looks like lever, historic leverage is low. So my model's like, this looks amazing. What a great buy. And of course, you read the transcript and realize that that's probably not what you want to be doing. Um, so that, that's a good example of where uh, you know, you need, you need to have, uh, you still need the human element. Yeah. And that's what I spent 10 years doing. So I have Does that sense. go all the way to like, I don't believe in the business. Um, or where, where do you draw the yeah. line in terms of, yeah, I, I, I don't view myself as being, I think the numbers tell me more about, you know, my, my favorite, my, my, my favorite set of analytical judgments is the management team and judging the management team. And I'm relatively certain that somebody who spent most of their career on, career on Wall Street has no business judging how somebody could run a shoe company, for example. Um, uh, the historic numbers tell you how they've done if they've been there, probably a lot better than your judgment talking to the management team and making some snap judgment about them. Um, so I, I'm very dismissive of that uh, in general. Um, I do think but where I do think you can really understand um, what a team is saying is when they describe, describe their strategy. And if they can describe it distinctly and it, it foots with what you're seeing in the numbers, that's a very good thing. It's, um, and so you can, you can understand why things are happening um, when the numbers and the, and the narrative align. Uh, but I think where you get into a lot of trouble and where people tend to get in a lot of trouble is when the narrative is really exciting, but the numbers haven't been backing it up. Um, and so, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of reading, um, one of my favorite things to read, ironically, is just the letter to shareholders. I like to read the, the, uh, the, the, tra- the, the earnings call transcripts, um, to understand what's happening. And then you learn stuff that you then can put into your models. Um, uh-huh. so, you know, doing fundamental underwriting teaches you how to improve your quantitative models. <laughs> Thank you.
and let's go back and kind of the 30,000 foot view of what the quantitative models are doing. Like you said, ranking, stacking, doing that, but what are they trying to pick up? What's the universe you start with? What do you end up with? Yeah, so there's about a thousand companies that I, I look at. Um, there's actually more companies in debt than there are in, equi than there is in equity. Um, and um, so you have a huge, huge universe. I tend to look, and that thousand just really refers to those companies that are either at the bottom end of investment grade. And, and for, your, for, your, for your listeners, investment grade is GE, IBM, big, big companies, mm -hmm. right? That aren't going to, are very unlikely to go default anytime in the next five years. Um, whereas high yield, um, traditionally called junk bonds, you know, always, always a Wall Street Journal article on high, high yield about how dangerous it is. Uh, really has two components to it. The very low end, which is stuff that is probably going to go bankrupt. And the high end, which is stuff that is just not large enough to be investment grade yet, um, but generally are pretty good companies. Um, Can you give uh, examples on both sides? Of that? Like what's some of that yeah. junk that you would actually consider junk? Uh, junk, I mean, a lot of the oil and gas companies, um, yeah. uh, even, even prior to the, the oil and gas crisis, just never converted, made money. Um, I don't want to say specific names, but there's, there's That's very right. often, um, you know, these are companies that generally have, it, the way I think about it is this, if you can, you can look at a company's return on capital, right? If they spend a dollar, how much do they get back? There are a lot of companies that spend a dollar and get 85 cents back. That's generally a bad thing over time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not sustainable, but there's also a lot of, and that's the very low end of high. That's that's sort of the guys that something has to change and something has to get better for them to get out of that predicament, or they need to restructure their debt and reinvest in the business or get acquired something. Then there's the guys in the middle and they make maybe three or four, or maybe two to 3% on their invested capital and they pay 7% on their bonds. So their cost of capital is above their return on capital. And that's not a great thing either, but they can last a lot longer. And again, they're really tied to the cycle. If things are going well, they're going to do really well. And if things are going badly, they're going to do really bad, right? And then there's the top end of, uh, of high yield where they're not large enough to be investment grade. They might be a one product company. Crocs is actually a terrific example. Crocs mm -hmm. is a company that's executing very well, but is in high yield because it is, it is a single product company. And... Um, you know, it's got, it's had, I, I will quote the Moody's report. It's had very, um, erratic EBITDA. Actually, I don't see that, but they said that. So I'm quoting them. It's yeah. useful, useful, uh, useful example, right? So that's a good example of a company that's at the higher end of high yield, uh, that has a very good business that's doing very well, but they have, they aren't investment grade, right? So those would be the examples. Um, and, um, you know, the investing at the very top end of that is really, I think, I think it's the high, it is historically the highest returning part of high yield and all of corporate credit. Uh, but it's also got a really nice characteristic for somebody like me was that most of those companies put out public financials, right? So I take those public, it's because now getting to your question finally, sorry. Yeah, uh, no, and are, yeah. are they all publicly traded? Not all of them are publicly traded. Got it. Okay. Um, so you can have public financials and be a private company. Um, and so the, um, I take those financials and I take the bond trading levels and I take the equity trading levels. Uh, and at the core of what I'm doing is I'm saying, well, I can take all the financial data and the trend data in the financials and rack and stack every company and set them up. I can stack them one on top of the other. This one is better than this one. This one's better than this one. This one's better than this one. The way I actually do it is by assigning a rating to them that is not an agency rating, which is my own rating, right? And then comparing that to where the market actually trades those bonds, right? I can look at a bond and say, well, this is trading, and there's some complexities in this, right? Because bonds have different maturities, they have different coupons. So you need to fix all that quantitatively. Mm -hmm. But you can look at a bond and say, it's trading here in the market. And that implies the market thinks it's rated like this. But my model actually says it's much better than that or much worse than that. And I only look at this, I'm, I'm long lonely. So I only look at the stuff that's much better. Um, yeah. and then I'm applying some other filters to try to catch some of the mistakes that happen, like, uh, deteriorating financials, high, you know, equity getting pummeled for some reason. And I don't know what's going on to try to filter out some of the risks. And that's, and that's basically what I'm doing, but I'm quantitatively ranking every single bond in the universe. Um, and then looking at where it trades. And let me, so you're coming up with a rating. Um, yeah. so my brain automatically goes to like, you're, triple B or double B, but you're yeah. saying more of a score of, and then well, how does well, that, you know what, in your brain, think 
Greg's, Greg's agency rating is double B. Uh, the market seems to be trading it at a single B and the agencies say it's triple B. And I have all three of those numbers and they, and they, they compare exactly like that. And then, but so. how does that work out in terms of, but maybe the market's pricing it in, you know, it, or you're saying, no, the market's pricing it over here. Yeah. I'm, I'm pricing it here. It'd be vice versa, I guess. Right. It'd be more cheaply priced than the ratings, uh, the public ratings are having it be. Yeah. Um, but exactly. how does that tie in with the yield one now? Right. Like, so in theory, the yield and the price, yeah. um, and the duration and all the rest are all tied into that puzzle. Yeah. So here, here's, here's, here's some, some bond lingo for all your, your listeners, but uh, yeah. you look at, you know, it, when, when you, one of the thing, one of the tricks to doing this uh, really well is when you go look at a bond that's got a 4% yield, you say, eh, it's 4%. Okay, fine. What does that mean? Right. Well, you know, the first thing you got to do is strip out what you'd get if you just bought treasuries of the same maturity and maturity isn't the right word. It's actually, we call it duration. It's the average life of the bond, right? Well, so it's trading at 200 or 300 basis points or three, which is 3% over that. And then um, uh, let's look at where everything else is trading in that, in that range. So we'll take out the treasuries. Now we've got that pure credit spread. That's the what I'm getting paid for the risk of default, right? Over time. So I'm getting 3% extra over treasuries to own this thing. Um, is that enough? Right. And that, and that's what I'm actually using to, com to compare um, is that spread, not the yield itself. And the reason I'm using the spread is that the yield will increase as you go out over time. So an eight year bond will have a higher underlying treasury rate than a four year bond. So that's what I'm doing. Now, in saying that, um, in, in credit, uh, there's this interesting concept that, well, well, in, well, in treasuries, right? In government bonds, everybody knows that if rates go up, the bond goes down, fine. Um, and rising rates are bad for treasuries. Yes, absolutely. And you buy treasuries, and I've written a lot about this. You buy treasuries because they are because when inflation expectations fall short, when growth expectations fall short, and both of those expected growth and inflation numbers go down, treasury rates go down, treasuries go up. And so it's a beautiful asset class. It just is. I don't do that. I don't play in that asset class. I play at an asset class that is linked to treasuries in some way because they're a fixed income instrument, but the primary driver is that credit spread. So when growth expectations go down, that's also bad for credit spreads. They go up, which is bad for the bond. When interest rates go up because growth expectations are going up, spreads go down. Right. And actually, the more important part of the pricing drivers and what I do is I spread. They, they will, that wins out every time. So if rates go down 50 basis points, treasury rates, um, my spread might go up 70 or might go up 75. Right. And that's bad. But if rates go up 50 and my spread might go down 75, those are extreme examples. But that's, that's how that works. And so, um, that when I when I look, that's why I strip out the treasury part and just look at that credit spread because that's the primary driver. And all of that comes back to the odds of this company defaulting on the bond. Yeah, I like. And actually, it's so funny because that's you know, when you're in credit. I think you're supposed to have a negative outlook on the world, but I have a very <laughs> positive outlook on my portfolio. Right. It this by the same token, you know, everybody you're getting paid for the probability default, but I am trying to find companies that are getting better. Right, I want those companies that have been paying down their debt going up in, in rating, or they're doing something else that you can't see as easily, right? They're doing something like they're buying more assets, but they're increasing their assets faster than they're increasing their debt, right? Because mm -hmm. they're actually really profitable. So they're, they're delevering the business, even though the, the actual quantum of debt isn't changing, right? And so what I'm playing for is not, I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding those things that I think are going to get downgraded and, and, and do worse. But I'm also actively trying to find those companies that are getting better. That right? will get upgraded. Yeah. That upgrade. So it's, just, it's, a, it's an almost an equity-like kind of analysis. And here's the cool thing about it is if I'm terrified of duration in treasuries because um, if rates go up, my bonds go down, I'm really excited about duration in credit spread products. <laughs> Because if I'm it, it, for the product, for the ones with, that are getting better, because if they get better, that spread goes down. And if you have a longer bond, that bond goes up more. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's how you, that's, that's the world of credit that you're really thinking about that credit, credit spread. Um, and so, and that's the, what, and that's really what my models are doing. I am targeting companies that are getting better. Um, which is super interesting. I, I always think of it as like high yield, the risk of default, all, all of that jazz. But you're saying, I'm just trying to identify good companies that are going to yeah. keep growing. Um, and the risk of default is rather, would you consider the risk of defaults the same across that whole bucket? No, I'm, um, I'm de-risking my portfolio, right? That's what I'm doing. I'm, a stuff, I'm taking stuff that's actually doing really well, right? So I'm actually taking lower risk, Um and so it, it's great. I think it's a, it's a way to de-risk your portfolio and avoid that default risk for which you're getting paid for in the first place. Mm. Um, but in so, theory, they each have some unknown absolute number of their risk of default, right? Yep. Yep. And so, and so how does this differentiate, you know, doesn't Citadel or whomever have a row full of quants that are analyzing this same stuff? How do you feel you're differentiating um, from some of the big shops that have infinitely more computing power and can analyze all this stuff. Yeah, there's, there's been a, there's something really interesting, I think, that, and it, it's thematic that, that, that's, that's gone on. Um, a lot of people got into, into uh, a lot of people have credit hedge funds, long, short credit, mm-hmm. right? And the idea there is that, I mean, it's really been sold to pension funds who have a 60-40 portfolio. They don't really want treasuries to do 40% of the portfolio, right? So they're going to these other products that promise bond-like returns, really, right? Bond-like downside, bond-like risk. Um, and hedge funds on the equity side were really a solution for that. And then that sort of bled over into the credit side, long, short credit. Um, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of long, short credit because um, credit is a positive expected return asset over time um, that already has low drawdowns if done well. Um, and so I'm not sure what you gain other than increased trading costs, um, which then, but also allows you to do increased fees and gives you access to the prime brokers at the bank. So there's, there's a lot of other yeah. benefits, right? Cause you're really yeah. profitable to the banks. Um, but um, you know, I do long only credit and the way I take down the downside is by focusing on that upper end of, of high yield, right? And so I'm very, very different. Um, I'm closer to a traditional long only manager who, been, who also have things like this as well. Um, but I mean, I, I would like to think I do it better. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm wholly, I mean, I'm wholly uh, quantitatively focused. Um, and we're very, and, and we're very unique in that we focus, we've, we've taken the universe and shrunk it down to that part of the corporate credit universe that really does well. So it's a very focused strategy. There's no reason other people can't do it. And, and there, there's other, there, I'm sure there are people out there who do versions of this. Well, is the, Easy answer is it's not a big enough opportunity for some of the yeah. largest shops. Yeah. yeah, it's not a big enough opportunity and also it's not sexy, right? So yeah. <laughs> the easiest way to raise money is to promise high yields. And the easiest way to promise high yields is to show high yields. And that's lower quality credit. That's private credit. That's all these other things and, and go into that. But the truth of fixed income investing is that your return increases with your yield, the coupon on your bond up until a point. So if you go down in quality, um, you generally make more money in triple B bonds than the grade above that, which is A bonds. And you generally make more money in double B bonds than you make in triple B bonds, which is the grade above double B. And you generally make less money in single B bonds, which yield more than the double B bonds um, because the risk catches up with you, right? Mm. You get your, your downgrade bad event happening things happen, start to happen in the single B territory and really get bad as you go down to the sort of the lower end and of, of high yield. And so you see, and, and I've put these, I've written about this a lot. If you just do a buy and hold strategy and you go and you just buy a bunch of double Bs, you buy a bunch of single Bs and you buy a bunch of triple Cs, right? Uh, your worst performance is actually going to be in that, that single B category um, where you started, you got paid a little bit more and then took on a whole lot more risk. And it, it was, and so you didn't get paid as much, but your face yield was really good. So yeah. you went out to market to people, you were paying, you were offering seven or 8%, not five or six, right? And so, um, and that's, and that's the hard thing. It's hard to see, it's hard to sell, it's hard to do, um, but it is the winning strategy is to we actually had a, take uh, a lot less risk. 
we had a blog post once called bud for the yield right and it was like the mlps the yield but the yield you're like yeah, yeah they're yeah. down 72 percent this year but that that 10 percent yield is really saving you yeah um so but isn't that wouldn't that be self-correcting right like anyone can run those stats or see that right that's not part of your uh, yeah. unique data set right that's just out there for everyone to see or no yeah it was it's, it's, it's less out there for people to see than you think i mean actually going and you have to have access so now on fred you can, you can go actually run this data yourself you go on fred you can pull the b of a double b index b index and triple c index you can see the results um and uh so this is you don't, don't take my word for it you can go run this it's not what you see in marketing materials. Uh, it, it, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. Things that work, work because they're a little bit counterintuitive. So it just takes small cap value, which we do in the other part of our business, right? You're, the, the, the mechanism of action for, for value is that you're buying companies and they actually get worse over time, but they had such low multiples that their multiples actually did better. And actually you had a very, you had a very good return. So they, they did less badly than you would expect. That's a very difficult thing to invest in. That's actually why doing a quantitative really helps. Yeah. Um, you know, in my world, it's buy the thing that's promising to pay you less. Right. And it's just a really hard. Yeah, thing to do. Yeah. And if you are an analyst at a credit shop, you do not make your career by going in and pounding the table on double B bonds, right? <laughs> you make your career by going in and pounding the table on the thing that's that's trading at 13%, right? And if that thing works, it's going, it's not only you're getting the 13%, but the yield's tightening it into 7% and you're getting a three, so you're getting 15% on top of your coupon, right? So you're making 20 something, 30% on that bond. That's how you make your career. And you can, those exist. That is absolutely a strategy that exists and it can work. The problem is that it comes also with the 30% negative return. Right. <laughs> and so you get both of those and Every your base then. rate of success is you, you better be, yeah, you're starting off with a losing base rate. And so that's, but you're starting off with a higher yield. That's much easier to sell. So um, I think that that is sort of the, the, the world we live in. And so the way that we view fixed income is to do it right. Um, you got to think about fixed income's main advantage. It's main advantage is that it's got, a known return stream and it's a contract they have to pay you back right so you don't go to fixed income and try to make equity returns that's not its purpose you go to equity to try to make equity returns you don't go to fixed income to protect yourself from inflation that's not its job it's not what it does you go to commodities or you go to high quality equities you go somewhere else um, to protect yourself from inflation um, you go to fixed income because in that bucket of safe money that you have it provides you a better return with a better drawdown structure. And so when you think about fixed income, it's highest and best use is as a, almost as a cash alternative. And it's not it's much riskier than cash, but it's your safe bucket, right? It's your safer bucket. It's the stuff that you want to kind of not draw down a lot and you want to feel good about. So you can either reallocate out of it in bad times or allocate into it when things are really good and you're just a little bit nervous, but that's what it does. It, I mean, listen, if you buy a bond that doesn't default, even if it goes up and down, it's still paying you the same amount at the end at the promise coupon, right? That's, that's your only game. And so that's how we view fixed income. You have to use it to its highest and best use, which is as a, an income generator that actually pays you back. And you don't want to do is go and all of a sudden add some point of that you're going to not get paid back. Um, and that's interesting because right, I don't think most people think of high yield as safe, and we might right. even get into trouble for saying it on here, but compliance yeah, yeah. people, it's safe not right. safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It I, has I, risk. It's not safe. It, is, it has a ton of risk. Let's be clear. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but you're saying it's, it's structurally, right? It's different structurally, so you should treat it as such. Instead of most people yeah. are perhaps treating high yield as equity replacement, right? right? You're saying, no, treat it more as bond replacement. It's, it's really hard to look at, say, a uh, look at a Crocs, right? You can buy the Crocs equity or you can buy their bonds. And I, I will look at, and, this, and Crocs is just a wonderful example to, to use on this, right? Um, and by the way, these bonds, unfortunately, I'm talking about Crocs and the bonds are 144A, which means that retail investors can't buy them, which is, again, really a, yeah. a frustrating thing about the, uh, the debt market. So, because about what I'm about to tell you. So, if you look at, um, and the market cap is 9.5 billion and there's 745 million of debt up there. So that's 
Are you taking more risk in the equity? The it's very clear you're taking more risk in the equity, right? Your valuation is 9.5 billion versus valuing the company at 745 million, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're talking about. Um, now that's an extreme example. Uh, most cases, the stuff that I'm investing in is, is about three times, the, the enterprise value is three times the level of the debt, roughly, or two, two to three times. So two, two to three times the level of the debt. So that if people want to sort of think about what it means to be in, in high, at the top end of high yield, it's that. If you're at the bottom of a high end, high end of high yield, that's much closer to one, 1 1.5, 1.75. So that gives you a, a relative sense for investors. So an investment grade is, or it doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, I mean, let's. Um, I'm trying to think of a bond right now, but um, it, it, yeah, it's it's probably going to be three or four. Um, it's going to be very very high. Cro Crocs is just because of scale, because it's smaller. It's not in investment grade, and other reasons. Um, so um, the Man, I think that that's a that's sort of how to think think about it. And so when you think about, but you think about when I say it, it it's my its primary advantage is it's it's going to get paid before the equity, so you own the company before the equity does, and they have to pay you a coupon, and they have to pay you back, right? Yeah. Um, that's 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 super. Powerful. We mentioned the oil and gas companies. We're talk we mentioned Netflix. To me, yeah. you could have two different types of business, right? The oil and gas need tons of capital, tons of yep. equipment. They got to put all that to work and then they're trying to get that small return. Netflix could add 50 million subscribers without any additional capital. Uh, they might be a bad example because they're spending billions on the content. But right, right, you have these new world companies that have subscription services and they can just add users without having to build a factory or build capital. Right. So do you find yourself moving more towards those types of companies that yeah. are capital needy? Yeah, so, I mean, to be clear, Netflix is a huge capital consumer. Right? Yeah. And, and I care about how a company consumes capital, whether it's through debt or whether through equity raises. Right. To me, it's actually I care about the business itself. Right. So one of the things I, I do um, is to look at just the total dollars in the door. Where did they get money? They got it from sales last year. They got it from equity. They got it from a loan. They got it. I don't care where they got it, right? But that's the pool. That's what they got. And then how did, and then what did they, what did they do with that the next year? And I'm actually, unlike most debt guys, if they grew sales faster than they took on capital, right? Because they actually reinvested in the business. And Amazon's a great example of this. Netflix is actually a great example of this. They grew their top line faster than they grew their assets, right? It's a good thing. Right? Yeah, because sales and gross profit are the raw material that makes profit, right? That makes net profit. If you grow those and you have, and there's some reasonable assumption that you can actually then convert that eventually into, into profit, um, that's okay. You, the management can make that decision. That's a very profitable decision. Um, so I do look at that. Um, I think um, uh, there are some oil and gas companies that actually do that very well and did that very well. Um, prior to the downturn. Now they got hit by the commodity prices, but they didn't go bankrupt. They mm -hmm. were very good stewards of capital. Um, there's a few, there, there, there are a few and far between, but I owned a few of those in, in 2014, 15, and they did fine. Um, and you could see it in the numbers before 2014 and 15, because they just had very high returns on invested capital. And that's not the only, in, in oil and gas, that happens to be a very good metric. They also, when you went dug into their financials and the footnotes, they actually told you there's a, the last footnote in oil and gas financials is actually the one you care about. You might as well throw away the whole other thing and just look at the last footnote. And they talk, it's actually the, um, the finding and development costs for oil and gas. And they go through what they did for barrel. And you can actually get a really good sense mm -hmm. of, of where, um, if they're making money or not. Um, so yeah, I, I, a little indifferent between new economy and old economy. I care much more about how much money they're putting in and how much they can add. Now it happens. A lot of the new economy companies are doing very well at that, right? Um, but they're still spending a lot. This idea that there's not capital and it's not called capital investment. They're still investing a ton in marketing, in, um, I mean, in content for Netflix. Um, yeah. Netflix for a long time looked like it was outspending its growth. I mean, it is it, so. Yeah, it was I like don't you're think, spending what? <laughs> like yeah, I don't think dollars, I don't think it's different. Yeah. I actually I don't get too tied up in I don't get it too tied up in these debates of whether you know assets versus you know I I I, I tend to I tend to strip it down to cash in, cash out. And that's the cleanest way you can get a look at a company over time. And what you find when you do that, and that's a very fixed income background thing to do, right? Um 
but that's the way when your entire career, because I actually remember I, I didn't start, I, I, I've looked across the high yield spectrum my entire career. As a fundamental analyst, I looked at stuff that went bankrupt. I looked at stuff that was bankrupt. So I, I have a much broader, um, and the way you'd spot um, the business that was failing was the cash in, cash out. And that was ultimately the test. Um, and that's why when they say fixed income analysts catch these things before equity analysts is because they aren't looking at the narrative necessarily because they don't, they don't benefit from the narrative. Um, they don't benefit from the growth. Um, they benefit from cash in, cash out. And if, if they're looking at a company and saying, okay, they've got these growth projections, but look at the amount of capital that's going to take. And they're going to take that from me. No, interest. no thanks. Yeah. yeah. Which is always the narrative of like, watch the bonds. The bond guys know best. Yeah. Um, which is, seems to be a Sometimes. little, Not always. yeah, right. That seemed to be debunked over the last year, but, um, yeah. uh, and, and do you ever consider, are there any like interest rate hedges or hedges with the equity in the company? Um, you know, no, um, I don't do a lot of that. I think, um, so we run as a firm, um, when we, you know, hedge, we don't hedge, we diversify, right. We go into different assets to do, we, we have a multi-strat fund that, has commodities for inflation that has growth equities for, you know, um, in, uh, uh, kind of risk off periods. It has small value for risk on, right? We, we do that. Um, so we allocate, we, it, it's, um, we, we allocate a, across asset classes, but it's a, it's a, it's an offensive strategy, right? I think it, yeah. it, it reflects it's, it's to go and try to go where the returns will be the best in within this particular, my strategy, I'm very pure fixed, you know, I am making money by delivering coupon or uh, an improvement in credit quality. And that's, that is what I do pure and simple every day. And not, re you didn't say return of principal at the end, right? Just the coupon and upgrade. And then you're usually out by the, I'm usually, I'm usually, I'm usually out. I, I, I tend to, um, one of the frustrating things about management bonds is the companies keep paying me back. So I'll have a great investment and then they'll pay me back. They'll call the bond, which is good because they usually call it above where I own it. But, yeah. um, you know, it's uh, or I, I tender for it technically. Um, but I do have this frustrating thing that equity guys don't have, which is my bonds go away. Um, so um, and I have to find some find something else I'm really excited about. Um, so. But yeah, no, that's it. I mean, and and yes, I I do get paid at the end, but very often, um, it, what actually what actually ended up happening is the bonds fall down um, my list over time, and uh, I I would say that my primary function is to buy from the top of my list, and then to the extent I need to clear room at the top of the list, I'll sell stuff that's gone to the very bottom, but otherwise I'll just hold it over time because holding bonds is a great thing to do. Yeah, You're, they so, literally pay you to hold them. They pay me to hold them. Um, and it seems like maybe because you didn't come from that quant background, right, that you would have, if you were pure quant, came out of some financial engineering program, it seems like you would have gone direct into the long short, right? Like sell yeah. those bottom half in your rankings, buy the top half. Yeah. Um, you're sort of netting out the credit risk and everything. And our, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, so. Have I you mean, modeled just, that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, actually, you know, you know, in a lot of quantitative strategies, the the alpha is driven by the by the short side, right? It's mm -hmm. it's uh, and so I'm just not owning it, right? Which is not, you know, yeah. and but it my my general, even when I the returns aren't, I think first of all it's very illiquid. It's hard, it's difficult to shorten credit. There's mechanical issues with it. Um, I also just think it's a it's once you add on the cost of shorting, it's not a particularly attractive strategy. Um, in my opinion, and then there's plenty of people who can disagree with me and probably do it really well. But I, I, I think there's life is too short. It's a lot easier to get paid to own good companies. And, you know, for what I'm trying to achieve for my investors in this fund, right. It's not something I, I need to do. Um, and so, um, but, you know, I think it's, um, uh, yeah, I, I probably would have gone to that. Um, I probably would have, been misled or maybe focused on a lot of things that I don't think are that important. Um, like uh, one of the easier strategies is looking at bonds within a company and just picking, picking the bond that's cheapest within the company, right? Because you're going to get a little extra for the same risk. Um, you got to trade a lot to do that. Liquidity is not there. Um, my view of the world is 
no focus on finding those companies that are just getting better over time from a credit perspective. Doesn't mean they actually necessarily have to get much better from an equity perspective, right? So it's a little bit different than equity. Um, but from a credit perspective, they're just getting better over time. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is just buy any part of the company, <laughs> any part of the capital structure in that yeah. company, uh, the debt capital structure. Well, that's interesting though. So in your universe that goes into the top of the model, is it each company's individual bonds or just the company? It is each company's individual bonds. We do also model in some of our machine learning. Um, we model it at a company level just to make the data easier to, um, and the results are very similar. Yeah. Um, but uh, typically and almost always the bonds cluster. So if the company's cheap, all the bonds are cheap. Yeah. Um, you, you rarely get, um, you might get one or two bonds that are anomalous. And certainly those ones are, I mean, I do effectively choose bonds because there are some that come further up my list than others, but I mean, it's number like, you know, there's a thousand bonds. There'll be number 54, 59, and 62, right? <laughs> they'll be, they'll be right in the, in the same range. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and then let's talk for a minute on, right. I don't even know where high yield spreads are, but they're, I thought at near record lows, tight, right? Tight, very tight. Yes. Tight. I mean, we call it tight. Yes. Yeah, right. So yeah. near record lows on high yield, we're at the zero bound on seemingly all treasuries around the yep. world, government bonds. Like how do you, tons of people are out there. I've mentioned a few times on this pod of like, right. It's the, the cliche is a uh, return free risk. Yeah. So, right. How do you approach the bonds overall at the zero bound or at these super tight credit spreads? Yeah. So um, I think um, the answer is you're not, I'm certainly not going down in risk. Right. I mean, I think and now you're, you're at tights. So uh, we, we've looked a lot at this, right? We're, we're in an environment right now, which is typically associated with, um, you know, tight spread usually means pretty decent growth. Um, it, if inflation is going to happen, it typically happens when it starts when, when spreads are tight, right? Um, because the economy is actually, inflation tends to happen when the economy is also doing really well. Um, and so, you know, if you're in, you're in an environment where spreads can't go any tighter, I think some people sort of say, well, then why bother with high yield, right? Yeah. And um, I actually think that's sort of the, if you think about what you're trying to achieve and what I just talked about, mm -hmm. that might be the time that high yield is, what I do is the most, or investment is the most, is more attractive, right? And I'll tell you why. Um, and and it's, it's, the answer is, don't, we say, don't shoot the messenger, right? Spreads are telling you there's, a lot, not a lot of return in the, in the market overall, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just, high yield does not exist in isolation. You don't have stocks at PEs of five and spreads at record tights. No, you have stocks at PEs of five and spreads at record wides. They're really attractive, right? Then you have stocks at PEs of 30 and spreads are really tight, right? That's how the world works. Everything's correlated. You don't get environments where spreads are really wide and stocks are super um, expensive at the same time. You don't get environments where stocks are super cheap and um, and and bonds are really expensive. Everything is correlated. And so, what you want to do is, if you're if you're thinking about preservation of capital, you're thinking about returns to the cycle. You might want to take some risk off. I personally think that higher, you know, call it, do an investment grade, do it higher quality, high yield, do whatever you want. Taking contractual returns in times of high valuations is not a, is not a bad thing. Um, you might still take losses, but they're going to look a lot better than the losses you're going to take in something that's high flying. Um, and so I think what spreads are telling you right now is that expected returns overall are low. But that, that is what they are telling you. And you have to think about it in, 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 that, in that way. Um, but I will tell you, um, this is, it's a, I'd much rather be investing when spreads are five or 600. <laughs> you make more money. Um, so yeah. they are, they are low. Um, and how do you square that with like the, the bond where this is what we're saying, the bond market has kind of been wrong, right? Cause they're saying this is a low return environment yet yeah. you're getting 50, 60% returns owning the equity side. So. Yeah. Well, what, I, yeah. And which has been incredible, right? The bonds were totally right in the beginning. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, and then there's just been this, this huge run. Um, uh, I think we're in, you know, we're in an environment where valuations across of everything are very high. Um, and whether I don't have an opinion on which way it goes. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I certainly, I find that it's easier to sort of stick to your, your knitting on that. I mean, I think, um, but um, I, I think when you look at um, 
the, the market environment right now, um, and you look at people are saying, you know, we don't, we have no, is it, is it sort of an inflationary crack up? Is it a deflationary boom? I don't know. I yeah. actually, I, I don't have an opinion. Um, I think, I think find that difficult, but I think that's when I say, you know, you have buckets to do different things, right? This is not your inflationary bucket. Um, this is not what this does, right? This is not your growth bucket. It's not what it does. This is your protect your assets bucket. Um, and so I think if you, when you're, for what I do in this, that's what I focus on. Protect them or generate a yield or that is yeah, and, one, and generate yeah. a yield, but it's, one it's, of the it's same. a, yeah. yeah, but it's a, it's a contractual return asset. Yeah. Right. So um, with, with, yeah. So that's, that's what it does. It doesn't, it, the nature of what it does doesn't change based on where the spreads are. It does change your expected returns. Got it. All right. And then is that, so valuations wise, that spread is representing that even in the bonds, people are reaching for yield, right? They're, they're driving the price of those bonds up, yields down. Yep. yep. Um, yep. Any part of that company they want. So that's, yep. it's, it's not as clear that there's a 80 PE in the bonds, right? I mean, it may be clear to you, but from looking from afar, it's hard to see that. Yeah, and, and the high yield spreads are a really excellent way to, to look at um, the way you should think about high yield spreads is risk tolerance in the, in the market. How much risk are people willing to take, right? When spreads are low, they're not demanding a lot of risk compensation for taking risk. So they're not compensating for taking risk. That, that's what it's telling <laughs>
$5 million to go buy this business. I've actually analyzed the business. Yeah. And I'm putting, taking that loan and putting it into a structured product that I'm then selling on to insurance companies. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not worth going into the details of that, but there's real work, real analysts. This is not, these are not ninja loans to, um, you know, unworthy borrowers in the mortgage crisis, right? These right. are, th this is, this is people who believe they're going to get their money back. Um, I think private, but I think like any competitive business, and this is now especially true of private credit, where they've started to go out and do loans directly to the private equity companies um, and hold the loans on their, effectively hold the loans themselves. Um, it, you know, they're, they're, it's competitive business, right? You're, 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 you're on a 10 towards taking too much risk for a little, too little compensation. Um, and by the way, private equity is a very competitive business. And you're going to tend towards overpaying and putting too much leverage on a deal to win the deal. Um, yeah. It is a very diverse set of investors in private equity. It's a very diverse or maybe less of a diverse um, set of investors in private credit. So um, I don't want to be out there and painting the entire both industries to one brush, but I would say that I think they're both very competitive with you know, and you can see where leverage would get too high and pricing would get too low. Now, how does that play out over time? If you get in trouble, it, you know, these are private funds that might be 10 year funds, right? So it just plays out in lower returns. Right, maybe right. wash you, which was on Twitter yesterday where their 65% year over year return on their endowment only makes 45%, right? right. <laughs> and so, uh, well, I don't think I don't think the returns in the private credit are sixty five percent. Exactly, or else no, it shows very poorly. But um, <laughs> yeah, their whole endowment. Yeah, but yeah, and, and so you, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, and so I think I think that that is that is a, a very difficult to track part of the market right now, with a lot of competition, and there's seems to be a magical demand for private credit that didn't exist when uh, a few years ago, and I, I think it's a, a product that very much is in vogue. Uh, and what's really interesting about allocators, right, is that their list of where they'll go invest is sort of private equity, hedge fund, and then for our credit allocation, private credit, right? <laughs> and then there's no there's no public bonds, there's no treasury, yeah. right? It, and and so you go to look on the mandates page on Bloomberg has a mandates page. You go to look at it, and there's literally not a click box for normal credit, right? That doesn't exist. It's just yeah. private credit. Uh, or distressed, or sorry, or distressed, um, and so I, th I find that uh, really telling. Um, and let, let's just quickly define private credit yeah. um, for the listeners. I'll yeah, so private credit. I mean, so yeah. private credit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you want to go? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, private credit is. Uh, let's say I am a, a large um, lender, right? I'm a private lender. Uh, I like, I'll do like Air Aries is. A, I, so I didn't work at Aries, so I also use Aries because Aries is a, a good example. Somebody's done this for a long time. Yeah. Um, they like will go. He works there. He might yeah. listen to this episode. Hey, Doug. Yeah. Oh. So, um, <laughs> so Aries, who has done um, middle market and private lending for many, many years, right? Um, will go out and you are a private business that's not public. Um, you run a chain of physical therapy shops, right? And you want to take out a loan. Uh, at two times EBITDA or five times EBITDA, whatever it is, you would you could go to a bank or you go to these private lenders, and the private yeah. lenders would lend you the money, but and actually just act in the same way that a bank would. Now, you're a private equity firm now, right? And you do buyouts, and you want ease of close and ease of transaction, right? So you don't want to go to a bank who then is going to sell it on to a bunch of people, right? You have to go through the whole road show and advertise your deal with everybody it is. You go to a big private lender who has, who can write a hundred million dollar loan. You can go to a hundred million, you can get a, you know, a $200 million, $500 million loan from one place and close it. That's sort of the, the promise of, of, of private. Yeah. Lending. On a Sunday night. Yeah. On a Sunday night. I actually yeah. did a deal on a Sunday night. I, um, I know, I know but, uh, myself. Um, and then I think Aries is actually owned by a, like Toronto teacher's pension or something, right? So it's actually like an investor loaning their own money. Yeah. So oh. it's, it's, and by the way, a lot of these private lenders are owned by private equity now. Yeah. So right. it's, a, it's a whole ecosystem. Um, and so yeah. Just so not to be confused for a second, I was thinking peer to peer credit. That's a no. whole other ball of wax. A whole other ball of wax. Yeah. Uh, what thoughts on that? I have no, I have no thoughts on peer to peer, and I haven't really dug into it as much. I think it's difficult, um, and uh, 
but I, you know, I, I'm sort of all for, uh, innovation in the space so yeah that seems like the perfect place for them right it's the same thing as companies and you get uh maybe individuals or whatnot yeah but um, companies i mean it's actually a little different because people don't tend to have audited financials with yes. track records yeah or or a priced past transactions right correct um and i'll keep going with my two more overall bond market questions. uh this one's not bond market but yield farming on crypto any ideas on that or thoughts you know, I, I would just say I, I've puzzled over some of the articles about it, um, yeah. just out of interest, right? Because anytime I see, so the, the general rule of thumb is that if treasuries are at 1% and high yields at 4 or 5%, right? And somebody's offering you 9% or 10%, something's different. Something yeah. that's a huge <laughs> spread. And there has to be either... Some this. of these are like 60%. You stake this right. and pull this over here and annualize, yeah. right? Yeah. So that, that's, I mean, I look at that and I think equity risk just from a pure numbers standpoint, right? Um, so in or a world counterparty today, risk. And a counterparty risk or something. There's yeah. something in there that would make, now people make fortunes by identifying these arbitrages, right? Where they say, okay, actually it isn't as risky as 9% would imply and therefore it's great. So I don't, I, the answer is I don't know. But my uh, my risk senses go up when I see a nine to ten percent. Yeah, you're not throwing it, a bunch of it into the fund, regardless. Um, and then, lastly, the debt ceiling. Any thoughts on that to show? You know, I have a very strong. Well, uh, I, I tend to uh, believe that one of the big investors' mistakes is to conflate political headlines with uh, investment returns, uh, and that includes in elections and things like that. And I tend to just stay away. I, I tend to not. Uh, opine on that at all um yeah. so I, the answer well, is I, I don't know i'm giving you very boring answers here sorry yeah, yeah well in theory right it could make treasuries go up or something but it's like when it happens i'll deal with it if it happens yeah um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll i'll react yeah it seems like political theater mostly yeah. um and then i just wanted to ask like generally what do what do most where we're saying most retail can't buy bonds but what do most normal investors get wrong about bonds and then what do most institutional investors get wrong about bonds yeah i mean i think i uh, i'll start with uh, sort of retail investors about bonds is that they you know there's a difference between treasuries and corporate fixed income or fixed income and that includes um i even put munis in that bucket and um somewhat and then i'd put um you know structured credit i'd put bdc i'll put all this anything that is tied to a riskier asset um, is something that you should think about as um, how much risk you, you know, you have to think first and foremost about the risk you're taking in that asset and whether you're going to get paid back. Treasuries, treasuries are very um, different and then they act, actually they move opposite of almost every asset. Um, and so uh, that needs to be thought about differently in your portfolio. Treasuries act, have historically acted as a very good counterbalance your portfolio in a recession. That is what they do really well. That is their purpose. If you're going to own treasuries in your portfolio, that's what they do, right? Uh, credit, non-treasury stuff, all the other debt, right, is really about having something that's not as, ten, hasn't historically had as high drawdowns or money losses as equity, right? That's contractual. So you're probably going to get paid. You're very likely to get paid what you're promised. Um, you spend line. And yeah, and it's, um, and so, especially for investment grade, right? And not necessarily for something lower rated. Um, and so where you're trying to earn a little bit of extra money in the money that you probably would, didn't want to put into the riskier assets anyway. So what I'd say is the, 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 the mistake that investors make is trying to make high returns in something that should be, you know, yeah. uh, a, a, a more defensive asset. That's why you're using it that way. Um, so what institutional investors get wrong, I think, is they've overlooked the beauty of treasuries and they've overlooked the beauty of corporate credit at times in favor of the shiny new toy of private credit um, and of, um, of uh, structured credit is actually pretty good, um, but um, the, you know, in, in favor of other, other things. And they've tried to run away from doing the board, boring stuff, right, in favor of you know, the rocket scientists doing long short credit funds. Right. And I to think that's point, it's not even a checkbox on the Bloomberg. Come on. Right. Right. <laughs> so, 
uh, that, I think that's the mistake is that you don't maybe, maybe just don't even waste your time, you know, do, do something boring and then move on and spend all your time on the, uh, on the risky stuff. <laughs> I love it. Any other final thoughts before we go into your, some of your favorites to end it up? Uh, no, thank you. This has been, this has been really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So my first favorite, favorite bond guru. <laughs> uh, I'm going to forget her name and I should have looked it up right before I got on this. There's a, there's a, um, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I do, I do like God, like I do like listening to him just cause he's, he's controversial and he also has opinions on, on everything. And I like opinion, people who have opinions on everything, even if they're, yeah. <laughs> even if they're wrong. Um, was that gun luck you said? Gun luck, gun luck yeah. yeah. I gun yeah. luck, yeah. And then, um, there's a woman at, op, um, at, a, at, um, oh, I'm going to forget her name. Give me a second and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll circle back at the end of the answer. It'll, it'll no pop into my head. Um, you weren't going to reach all the way back to Bill Gross. I only know no. two, Bill Gross and, and Gunlock. So. Yeah. Um, best book on credit. Is it the Pinkity one that I still haven't read that's sitting here staring at me with like, it's. Antia Manin's Expected Returns. Uh, he's an AQR guy. He wrote a book called Expected Returns, has one of the best credit sections in it. Uh, I think he nailed most of the key themes and credit there. It's a big, it's a big tome. It's more of a reference book, but that is a, an excellent resource for equity too, by the way. It's mostly about, it's not mostly about bonds at all, but they, the, the bond part is excellent. Nice. We'll put that, uh, we'll look that one up. Um, favorite, I was going to, usually we have someone in New York or London. So I was going to ask your favorite restaurant, but in, in uh, Litchburg, what's the name of your town? Again? I'm going to, no, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to go at 120th street and uh, I think it's I think it's Amsterdam, Masala, Ethiopian. It's great. Masala, Ethiopian. You eat with, eat with your hands? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, we had a good one over here in Chicago on uh, Well Street, like in Old Town over there. Um, so favorite Chicago bar back when you were around these, these parts? I, where you are. Was it the Roscoe Pub? The, or the, or I used to love going up there. I don't know if the it's Village around. Tap. Yeah. Village Tap. It was it. Village Tap. That's it. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> Um, and were you a Northwestern fan or Dartmouth uh, football or what? Did you get converted? Yeah, I've never, I've never been a big sports guy. So I played sports. <laughs> I didn't do, I didn't watch them. All right. Uh, not, you're not missing much with, uh, with Northwestern. Uh, and then all our guests as favorite Star Wars character. Oh, so it's, um, uh, you know, I, I should have known this before I came on and I, I forgot yeah. to do it, but, um, <laughs> oh man. I would have to say, I mean, I have to go with the Ewoks. I'm sorry. The Ewoks. All right. <laughs> I love it. Um, I used to know that chief guy's name. It'll come to me in a minute. But um, yeah, all of them collectively. That's not going to go over with the with the heavy fans here, but I like yeah. it. Far yeah. Far. People hate I'm pulling it out of my deep, darkest memories. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's been fun, Greg. Thanks so much. Um, and best of luck there in western connecticut we'll look you up if i'm ever that area yeah. which seems unlikely but uh maybe if it's i'm not, in it's Albany not, it's or not something. really you don't really pass through here with that yeah it's kind of saratoga ish kind of close to that no 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 i'm south of uh I'm almost up in western mass yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm right, well, away from there. so i'm up in the um like uh, salisbury areas up here Richfield, kent that area if any of your listeners know where, the, where those places are all right well i'll do a road trip visit ben on his farm and then you up, up north there yeah. great all right greg great talking to you thank you very much thank you the derivative is brought to you by cme group cme group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange for more information and educational resources about futures and options visit cmegroup.com been listening to the derivative links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel follow us on twitter at rcm alts and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com if you liked our show introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe and be sure to leave comments we'd love to hear from you